Frank, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is now become a science thanks to your innovative work and has great implications for humanity. What are some of these? In the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we have the goal of providing much useful information to humanity on many different levels. First is just pure science. What are the limits of biology? Are there alternative biologies to the one that exists on Earth? Different molecular systems, different results of evolution. Uh, these are of interest in their own right just to understanding how life operates in, on our planet. There are practical possibilities that can be deriving from our searches. <clears throat> and these are new science information, new technical information, which we could use to improve the quality of life on Earth. Uh, ways to engage in space travel, which are more effective, less expensive, uh, faster. We need all of those things just to explore our own solar system and eventually, in due time, actually to colonize space, as we must do when the sun begins to become a giant star. One of the fundamental questions that people naturally ask is, how can we be confident that, they're, that the search is worthwhile? Because how, how do we know there's any other intelligent species in the universe? And you've come up with what's now quite famously called the Drake Equation to give us some way of estimating these probabilities. Take us through that. How do, what is the Drake Equation? How did you come up with it? And how does it work? Uh, <clears throat> the equation is an equation which gives us an estimate of the number of detectable civilizations in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And of course, that's of great interest in, our own, in its own right. The answer is one, by the way, suddenly becomes an uninteresting subject. There's nobody else out there to find, but the answer is not one. Uh, it, it also gives us guidance in selecting search uh, methods. If the nearest civilizations are very far, far away, you will search in a different way than if perhaps you think most of the stars are populated. So it gives us guidance in just developing the search technology. Now, how does the equation work? It simply quantifies the history of the evolution of our solar system and the life on Earth, which we know really very well now. And from that, we know that for us to be here with our high technology did not require any special freak circumstances. The processes that took place to produce us were completely normal processes, and they should have happened many, many places in our galaxy. And so we just assume, and with good, pretty good justification, that what took place in the history of life on Earth will be repeated elsewhere. So the assumption is that what happened here would, would, is not special and therefore can happen in lots of places. And the equation takes a number of different terms, multiplies them together as a probability, and comes up with a, a range of how many other intelligent species there are in our galaxy. So That's each of it. these terms then become important. That's exactly right. <clears throat> and and the, the way it works is that we start with the rate of star formation. The uh, more stars you have, the more opportunities to have life, obviously. Right. So that's the first term. That's the first term. You multiply that by the fraction of stars which actually have planetary systems. Right. You have the rate of production of planetary systems. Okay. More is better, yep. as far as we're concerned. Right. You then multiply by the third factor, which is the number of possibly habitable planets in each system. It needs to be in the right place. It needs to be in the right place. Not too hot, not too cold. Right. It should have some liquid water if it's going to have life like ours. Right. Although there we start to get parochial. We get yeah. really start limiting ourselves to, yeah. uh, to our kind of life. But anyway, that's all we can do because that's all we know really exists for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so we multiply by the fraction of the habitable, the habitable planets which actually give rise to life. Right. Then we multiply by the fraction of those which evolve an intelligent species. 
And then the next step is the fraction of intelligent species which develop a technology we can detect, because our goal is to detect. Because you might have aquatic, uh, maybe intelligent yes. dolphins that just never never build a radio have a great time themselves and yeah. develop all sorts of philosophies and religion. They just not not able to communicate it from the water. They, they cannot <clears throat> build a radio transmitter. <laughs> they can transmit to the stars. Uh, when you've multiplied all those factors together, which we've mentioned so far, you have the rate of production of detectable civilizations. Now, with our best knowledge, that number is actually about one civilization per year, which is a very heady number. You think, wow, that's a lot. But of course, our galaxy has 200 billion stars, so when you think of it, look at it from that standpoint, it's not all that great. Now, we, we, at this point, we become perhaps realistic or conservative. I don't know what you call it. But we assume that these civilizations which have become detectable, as ours is now, do not remain detectable forever. That there's a finite lifetime to their detectability. And this is not necessarily the lifetime of the civilization. It's a lifetime of the time when they are releasing signs of their existence, which we can detect from great distance. Uh, for example, lights of cities at night. Uh, in our case, the main sign of our existence is our television broadcasts. How long will those go on? Uh, what other signs of our existence may persist? In any case, the conservative thing to do is to assume that there is some termination to the longevity. And for one reason or another. For another one reason or another. Maybe it is an asteroid hit, some great catastrophe, but more likely it, it is just increased technical sophistication because for us to detect them, we have to detect some energy they waste. Mm. And every civilization will understand that you conserve energy, as we have sure. learned. But, but on the other hand, if a civilization deliberately wants to broadcast, then it's a different story. There's a different story, and that complicates the picture, but only in a good way. Uh, because in the equation, we end with the factor of the longevity. And when we multiply then everything together, the answer is the number of detectable civilizations. Now, some of the factors in the equation we know very well. The rate of star formation, the fraction of stars with planets, that's now an observational fact. Yes. When I started in this game, that was a total mystery. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the longevity is something we, can, we will not know until we have succeeded, which is one of the diff difficulties in this problem, that you don't know how much, it, how much it's going to how much searching it's going to take to succeed until you've succeeded. Sure. And that really gets us in trouble when we try to raise funds for this okay. project because you can't guarantee success. But if you take some rational value for uh, longevity, you end up with at least thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of detectable civilizations, and that's very exciting. Now, one factor that enters into the longevity is are there civilizations which intentionally broadcast beacon signals, as we call them, for the benefit of the newcomers, such as us. <laughs> is there an Encyclopedia Galactica, which is being transmitted continuously from one civilization to another? If that's going on, then the longevity is much larger and raises an interesting philosophical question. Are other civilizations altruistic? Because to broadcast a beacon and encyclopedia you are using your resources to benefit others with no benefit to yourselves. So, interesting question. Are intelligent creatures intrinsically altruistic? If they are, there are a lot more of them to be found. It has a practical consequence, right, right, right. which is interesting. And again, we won't know the answer until we've succeeded. But that is how the equation works. And it has given us guidance. It alerts us with our best knowledge that we may have to look at 10 million stars before we succeed. That's a challenge to our search systems and our planning searches. And uh, all of this, by the way, came out of a meeting which I organized at the request of the National Academy of Sciences after I conducted the first search in 1960. In 1961, they wanted to hold a meeting to find out, you know, what do people really think about this weird new business? <laughs> of searching for civilizations. And I was the total organizing committee for the meeting. And so a few days before the meeting, I thought, well, I've got to organize the sessions. What are we going to talk about at this meeting? 
And by the way, to this meeting, I, we invited every person in the world who, who we knew was interested in this subject, all 12 of them. <laughs> they all showed up, uh, which was good. One of them got a Nobel Prize in the midst of the meeting, so that well. shows that there was some, some pretty powerful minds already thinking about this subject. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I was planning for the meeting, I thought, that what do we have to know to quantify how difficult the search is? And it was all the factors that are in the equation, and I realized, okay, this is what we have to know about, and then it hit me that, oh, if we just multiply them together, we get our answer. <laughs> so the equation was established as the agenda for a meeting. That's how it came about. 